You are watching the press preview, a first look at what's on the front pages as they arrive. And it is now time to see what's making the headlines with Daily Mirror columnist Susie Boniface and former Conservative Special Advisor Anita Boateng. They'll both be with us from now until just before midnight. So let's see what's on some of those front pages for you now. Well, the Times reports on the pressure on Rishi Sunak to give millions of public sector workers a 6% pay rise alongside a tribute to the eight-year-old girl killed in yesterday's Wimbledon crash. The Mirror carries the same photograph as well as a message of thanks from Fiona Phillips for public support over her Alzheimer's battle. The Express reports that the Prime Minister has been urged by fellow Conservatives to talk up Brexit. The Daily Mail reveals that Westminster has more electric cars than six major northern cities combined. The headline, proof politicians are out of touch on electric cars. The Guardian headline reads, egg or dairy found in a third of vegan products and also reports on Andy Murray's crashing out of Wimbledon. Mickey Mouse versus Home Office. The Eye reports on the removal of Disney murals at a children's asylum centre. The Telegraph carries former BBC chairman Richard Sharp's comments that the wealthiest households should pay more for the BBC. While The Star reports that robots have promised not to rebel against humans. And a reminder that by scanning the QR code you'll see on screen during the programme, you can check out the front pages of tomorrow's newspapers while you watch us. And we are joined tonight by Daily Mirror columnist Susie Boniface and former Conservative Special Advisor Anita Boiteng. Welcome to you both. Um, we're going to start with the, the Express and um, the story that was on many of the, the front pages yesterday. And this is terrible accident in Wimbledon at um, that... Uh, school, the eight-year-old girl has now been named by police. Susie? Yeah, uh, her name is Selena Lau, and apart from the fact that this is a dreadful tragedy, I don't think I really want to talk about it, because my daughter's only a few months younger than her. Um, it's just horrific, and I can, I can imagine what her family must be going through. Yeah, and it is. I, I can understand that. Uh, I mean, it, it, it is a... A very um, troubling, unexpected, um, heart-wrenching story because th there is no way that anybody at, at the school, the parents, the children could have prepared for anything like that happening. Yes, um, and I, I should say that the, it's not being treated as sort of terror-related or anything like that. Um, and, yeah, it's it's a deep and, and heartbreaking tragedy, and I think that the family have released a kind of really moving tribute to her as this kind of cheeky and vivacious young girl, and it's just a deep tragedy that's it's really being felt across um, all of South West London but the entire country um, tonight. So I think all our thoughts and prayers are definitely with the family. Indeed. And uh, uh, another eight-year-old who's in a, a critical condition in hospital and a 40-year-old um, also in a um, critical condition. Let's move to uh, a bit of politics. We'll head to The Times, the front page of The Times. And we read that the Cabinet has split over this 6% uh, suggested uh, public sector pay rise. Susie? Yeah, so the Conservatives have got... They're on a very sticky wicket with this, the government. What's happened is that over the past year or so, uh, when the independent pay review bodies came back and recommended a, a fairly lowish pay rise for the public sector, inflation then kicked in. The unions started saying that we need paying more than the pay review bodies actually said, because inflation has happened since they've made their decision. And the government said, no, 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 we have to stick with what the independent pay review body said, no matter what. And that's led to all the strikes that we've seen throughout the public sector. Now we're in a situation where next year's award is being decided by the same independent pay review bodies. And because inflation has happened, they've made a different calculation. And so they're saying that we have to pay so many billions more and there's going to be roughly maybe a 6% rise across the public sector. And that isn't just people who've been out on strike. That's the police. That's the, uh, that's the border force. That's the uh, prison agencies. That's uh, the army, the navy, the air force. It's people that cannot strike as well. And so... 
having said, we've got to follow the independent pay review bodies no matter what, because it's cheaper. They're now in a situation where the independent pay review bodies are recommending that they pay quite a few billion for the public sector. And that just goes against, they, they can't suddenly turn around and say, well, we're going to ignore the independent pay review bodies. And at the same token, they can't turn around and say, well, suddenly we found billions of pounds because all those things would make them look like they were lying last year. Uh, and what no one is really talking about is when you do have pay rises for the public sector, um, about uh, 80p in every pound comes back to the Treasury in some way. It, it grows the economy. It's a benefit. It's a boon to other people. It gets spent. There's tax. There's more pension payments, all the rest of it. There is actually a reason that you would, uh, economically speaking, try to grow the public sector a bit or pay a bit more money because that you know makes all the, all the dashboard light up in a positive way. But this particular government doesn't want to do that kind of thing. So it's... It's, um, it's sort of stuck in a, between a rock and a hard place. Mm. And Anita, in terms of the, the cabinet split, um, we read that five cabinet ministers are urging Sunak to respect the recommendations of the independent pay review bodies. And that's obviously an attempt to, to prevent um, further industrial action. Well, yeah, I think um, the government is on a sticky wicket. I disagree with which sticky wicket it's on. It's on a sticky wicket because the reality of public finances, inflation and um, the need to recruit and retain is a really, really difficult balancing act. So it's unsurprising that departments where the independent pay review body has come back with sort of between roughly sort of six, um, five to six percent recommendations for pay rises are the departments where, according to the Times, ministers are sort of privately urging that that be committed to, but not from existing budgets. So it could cost as much as sort of five billion to pay for all these pay rises, which, you know, if that has to come from existing department, um, existing departmental budgets would mean them having to make really difficult choices about how you can fund and deal with, for instance, the NHS wait list if you're also trying to give junior doctors a five to six percent um, pay bump. So these are really, really difficult decisions. And, and to be clear, the reason why this is so tough is because the government has the option of borrowing additional money or increasing taxes. Now, cost of living is really biting. And so increasing taxes at this moment where taxes are already at sort of 30-year highs would be, you know, really tough for people who are starting to feel the pinch. Likewise, borrowing is more expensive than ever because interest rates are really high to deal with inflation. So borrowing, I think, in December was around sort of £17 billion for a single month, which is the highest it has ever been on the ONS's record. So there really, really are no easy choices. And that is why the government has got itself, is in this very difficult position. And just to say... You know, whether it would be a Labour administration or a Conservative administration right now, they would all face that exact conundrum. And it's exactly what's playing out across a lot of countries in Europe. Uh, staying with politics, we'll have a look at the eye. But this political uh, story involves Mickey Mouse, Susie. Uh, how so? Yeah, well, apparently, uh, Junior Immigration Minister um, Robert Jenrick was on a visit to a children's asylum centre uh, the other day and reportedly saw a, a mural of Mickey Mouse and some Disney characters that were there at the entrance in the lobby and the reception uh, and suggested that they should be painted over because it was too welcoming. That's the report. Uh, and it's now been since painted battlefield grey. And uh, that's kind of come back to bite him on the bum a bit because all that's happened is that it's kind of got out and lots of artists are now offering their services to repaint it something a bit more welcoming, a bit more friendly, because regardless of what you think about immigration or Robert Jenrick, um, children who have come here in whatever form are not illegal. They haven't broken the law. It's not against the law to be trafficked and it's not against the law to be brought somewhere by your parents. Um, they are children. Uh, and there's no harm whatsoever in having a children's asylum centre reception area that is something other than institutionalised and looks like a prison. So uh, it, it, all that happens is it's, it's another way that the Tories have managed to make themselves look heartless. And Robert Jenner may be a lovely bloke. They, their policies may not be heartless, but it's the kind of thing that the optics of it just make it look incredibly heartless. And then, of course, if you also believe their policies are heartless, it all adds to um, perhaps why they are so far behind in the polls when it comes around to um, people considering uh, what's going to happen at the next general election next year. 
Anita, the optics on this just simply don't look good, do they? Uh, we read that officials accuse him of competing with his boss, the Home Secretary, Suella Bradman, to be toughest on migration. It's not a good look. Well, I mean, it, it seems that, you know, you can get a story about the Home Office. There's definitely so much interest in it. But I think the reason why that is the case is not because of stories about optics. It's because there is a real challenge going on in our asylum system at the moment, where across all of Europe, you have small boats arriving um, in numbers that have not been seen before by a lot of Western countries. And they're all grappling with the amount of resources and time and facilities it would take to adequately deal with that. And this feels like a distraction actually on both sides from the fundamental challenge, which is not being dealt with. And I think the reason why the government is struggling is not because people think that, or I mean, I would argue it's not because people think, well, the government is not is being heartless in its painting of murals it's because there is a perception there isn't a grip on this issue. And I don't think there is enough serious conversation on either side of the political divide about their actual solutions. Both sides seem to say, well, what we want to do, and Labour in particular, we want to make sure we attack the criminal gangs. Do you think the government hasn't been trying to deal with that problem? This is a huge and incredibly knotty issue which deserves focused policy conversations and agreements with countries in Europe and not this sort of focus on are you nice or are you not nice, which is, doesn't deal with the fundamental systemic issue around the numbers that we are seeing and how you would manage to process them and reach deals with other countries to be able to remove those who are not successful in seeking asylum. Absolutely hear your, your points uh, loud and clear, but would have you would you have advised Robert Jenwick to remove the mural? Just out of interest, I just wanted to know whether you think that was a, a bad decision or not. Uh, to be honest, I've never been in an asylum centre. I have no idea what's appropriate or what's not, and I've absolutely no idea whether this story holds any water whatsoever. So I, I really wouldn't quali be qualified to comment. OK, that's a definite no comment there. Um, let's uh, move on to... The Express, the front page of The Express, um, and apparently the Prime Minister's being urged to talk up Brexit. He's not doing enough to make um, it a positive story, according to, to his, um, well, con Conservative backbenchers. It, it is this time round. Yes, his own MPs. Susie. Yep, so this is Brendan Clark Smith, who is the MP for Bassett Law uh, in Nottinghamshire, which is sort of considered to be the red wall um, and he got elected in 2019 with uh, a fairly sizable majority on the basis of Brexit and so he is understandably trying to say we need to talk about Brexit we need to get me re-elected please. Um, Bassett law at the moment is looking like it will go Labour if there was an election tomorrow so that's perhaps why he's urging Rishi Sunak to go back and beat the, the 2019 drum again please. The trouble is Tory and Labour are both trying very hard not to discuss Brexit for the simple reason that it puts off a huge number of voters. Everyone's quite fed up of it, number one. Now, everyone's bored of talking about it. And the second thing is that the latest polls, I think there was one out about five days ago, showed that there is massive support for rejoining the EU and, and people are regretting having Brexit in the first place. Now, rejoining is fairly ridiculous. It's, it's probably not going to happen. But that, that kind of opinion poll, which shows that people don't really want to talk about Brexit in the same way they don't want to talk about the, the reason why they burnt their own hand on the kettle. It, it's because they think, oh, no, 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 we don't want to do it. Let's not. Anybody who therefore says, as a politician, let's talk more about Brexit, is bonkers. Because anyone who talks about it on any side is just inviting trouble as far as the opinion polls and the ballot box is concerned. You're going to see when that comes up to that next general election, everyone's trying very hard not to talk about it. Very, very hard. Um, I think it's going to take some time probably before the general public wants to talk about it again as well. <laughs> you might be right on that. Uh, Susie and Anita, we're going to take a break there. <laughs> we're going to take a break there. Do stay with us coming up, but we'll discuss this story on the front of the Telegraph that the US could back Britain over Ukraine NATO bid. Stay with us for more on that and other stories. Welcome back. You are watching the press preview. Still with me, Daily Mirror columnist Susie Boniface and former Conservative Special Advisor Anita 
Boateng. Let us have a look at the uh, Telegraph front page in this story, um, suggesting that Joe Biden is considering backing British plans to fast-track Ukraine's entry into NATO. Anita. Yes, this is a really interesting um, story. It's ahead of the NATO summit in Lithuania uh, next week. And um, basically, after Joe Biden said quite recently that there would have to be the same rules that, you know, apply to Ukraine as others, which basically means you have to have this membership action plan where you undergo military and diplomatic reforms before you can join NATO. Now, the US representative to NATO, Julian Smith, has indicated that, that, that NATO NATO allies might agree next week at this NATO summit in Lithuania to have Ukraine forego having one of those action plans, which would put it on a fast track. Um, so I think a very interesting development and maybe a sign that the kind of UK approach that has been more, I guess, gung-ho about getting Ukraine um, closer into NATO is paying dividends. The other interesting part of the Telegraph story is that Biden is going to stop off in the UK again um, to meet the king for the first time, well, I mean, the first time as king, and also to meet um, Sunak once more to sort of um, compare notes. And this is the fifth time that they have met and clearly a sign that relationships between um, Joe Biden and Rishi Sunak are certainly very warm. And it feels as though the trip that Sunak made um, a few months ago to the US really was a kind of turning of the tide in their relationship and a sign that they are becoming much closer allied. Yes, and Susie, the, um, Mr Biden only said last month that the US wasn't going to make it easy for Ukraine to join the defence bloc because they've got to meet the same standards, uh, quote, as everyone else, as existing members. So something seems to have changed, does it not? Yeah, what else has possibly happened in Ukraine in the past month? Was it maybe the fact that the mercenary force decided to turn around and march towards Moscow? Um, obviously, what's happened... Uh, and. Is, nothing has changed in the sense that, you, as Biden said, you do still have to, and as Anita said, you do still have to meet all the requirements to join NATO. That hasn't altered. And there's no way that they could have sort of a, a second string to NATO or a second class version. But um, what has altered is that Putin's um, strength has completely been obliterated, such as it was anyway, as head of an armed forces that wasn't doing very well. It's been obliterated by the attempted coup. Um, his time in office is probably ticking down to uh, an inevitable defenestration at some point, which is his favourite method of dealing away with um, with people. Um, and the, therefore, the long process of getting a country into NATO can perhaps begin because What's Putin going to do? He's going to rattle the sabre a bit. But although he's a nuclear armed nation, he hasn't used his weapons yet. He's very unlikely to. And the chances are now that he doesn't have the support within his own forces to actually be able to do that anyway, even if he decided to press the button. And so Biden has perhaps reasonably seen that the time is ripe to move a bit and have some NATO expansion. Interesting. Uh, we've just got about uh, a minute or less Anita to talk about the tennis and Andy Murray. Could this be the last time we see him playing at Wimbledon? He says, I may not come back next year. Yes, he was clearly very crushed. Um, so this is obviously the 10th anniversary of Murray winning Wimbledon, um, you know, and losing to someone who's sort of 12 years younger than him, probably underscored the point that he's been in this game for a very long time. Um, and it's been six years since uh, Murray has made it to the um, second week of Wimbledon. And it's clearly been a challenging moment. So who knows what, how he'll feel once the sort of, you know, the agony of the immediate loss um, kind of fade somewhat but yeah certainly really devastating for those big Murray fans of which I'm sure we were all